Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, exciting to share with you uh, what's happening in the battery space. Uh, the title of my presentation is How Far Can Batteries Go? Far right here has multiple meanings. It can mean how far an electrical car can drive per charge. It can also mean how many years it can last. Would you be able uh, to produce a battery that's uh, immortal, can go forever? That's a question we ask a lot. How far can also mean how wide range of applications batteries can impact. So in the next 15 minutes, uh, let me uh, share with you some of the learning over a decade and uh, what, what could be next. So our battery technology really starts from here. We utilize what's already in electronics. For the cell phone, for the laptops, this is 18650 cell. You open it, you see a cylinder, you know, cut it open with this roll of materials right there, and consisting of graphite particles and lithium metal oxide. So lithium ions are moving back and forth inside the batteries with the electrolyte, with the separator right there, electrons are moving outside. This is a simple device, just two terminal. From yesterday, from Dick Swanson, I was laughing really loud, right? It's a solar cell, it's very simple as well. It's two terminal device. However, you need to make billions of those. It, it becomes not as simple as what you think. So starting from electronics, this has the history of about 27 years of a battery use in electronics. So this already built up a really good supply chain reduce the cost to the level. In the past decade also, we started to think about, as a whole society, whether this could be used for the electrical car, for the drone, and for the grid scale storage. So what we, we have achieved after 27 years, energy density somewhere about 250 watt per kilo. Can we go to 500? That has a significant meaning right there per charge if you have 500 watt per kilo. That basically means with a normal size battery, you are going to have 500 miles driving range. That's even can exist, the gasoline car. So the sale cost, instead of somewhere around a little bit over $100, can you go to half, $50 per kilowatt hour? This also has significant meaning that will allow electric car to be affordable to the general public. The cycle life, we usually have a thousand cycles, seven years also. Indeed, my phone, after three years, I can already see significant decay. So can we make a nearly immortal battery? That's 10,000 cycles, 25 years or 30 years. That really means after your car retire, you can take out the battery pack and put it into the electric grid to use it for quite a while. This will help reduce the cost tremendously. In terms of charging, we are usually in the one to two hours charging range. Can we do 15 minutes? In reality, we really, really like to go less than 10 minutes. This will allow us to build less charging station to also reduce the infrastructure cost. And the battery so far is not safe. Can we make a completely safe battery? No matter what you do, how you abuse them, they never catch fire, they never explode. We are not there yet. So any of these parameters I show you right here without sacrificing others, if you can improve the parameters going from the black to the red, that's a huge breakthrough to the whole battery space. So in order to increase energy density, you need to work on materials. So in the past decade, we have been seeing the idea how do we use silicon and also down the road metallic lithium to replace graphite that's still 10 times more charges compared to graphite. And how do we use something like sulfur? That's also 10 times high capacity compared to the lithium metal oxide currently used. Not only is that, sulfur is very low cost. I'm going to come back to that. If we can enable these new materials, we can move from 250 watt per kilo. That's right now. And the next five years, we are going to see in the commercial space, this is going to go up to close to 400, maybe five, maybe 10. I'm giving an estimate time, uh, timeline right here. Lithium metal coming in combined with the traditional cathode and sulfur. 
this allow us to go to 500 or more. So we do have materials, we do have the biophysics chemistry available to do so. However, it's really challenging. These materials carry a lot of problems we have to solve. So let me uh, 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 share with you one type of the electro we have been working on for a decade now. It's a silicon. 10 years ago, when we published the first paper, it tried to solve this problem. Silicon absorbs a lot of lithium ions, but the volume expansion is four times. Compared to in the past, what we know is we can handle less than 10% of volume expansion. Now you are talking about 400%. We are a completely different regime. How do you handle those problems at the materials level, electro level, and the wholesale level? It wasn't clear. So we learned about this from our generation one design, that silicon nanowires. This was funded early days by my, I just joined the faculty, by my starting up fund, as well as the Global Climate Energy Project. And moving to now, up to now, we have 11 generation of materials. Each generation is trying to solve one big problem that's very, very challenging. So 10 years ago, we invented the silicon nanotechnology and silicon uh, and, and Stanford right here, it's hard not to start our company. So we did uh, try to uh, commercialize this technology. Now we do have the product line on the market. Uh, the nanowire base one already get to somewhere about 400 watt per kilo. We also have the silicon nanoparticle mixing with graphite that gets you somewhere close to 300 watt per kilo. These are the leading product in the market. And, but the scale up is certainly very challenging. We raised $150 million to get us somewhere. We still need more to go. But let me make a comment along this whole process. This is something I learned. So coming back to that uh, 10 generation of design, it's indeed, in terms of university funding, it's very, very challenging. You can raise funding continuously for a decade to support an idea that can go such for such a long time. This combined the support of uh, my startup package, the GSAP, indeed the Kaos Investigator Award, a President C is sitting right there. He was the one giving me this uh, $10 million award uh, back to roughly 10 years ago. And then later, supported by Department of Energy. So this is a lucky case. We have funding continues until nowadays to work on silicon to solve all this problem. But all my other projects, I see it's very challenging to do so. If some of the policy maker right here, my feedback to you is how do we come up idea, continuous support energy, and also good idea that's promising continuously without gap. That will be very important. So talking about battery safety, it's not safe yet. Every couple of years, we're going to see major instance right there. What happened inside? You have this uh, anode and cathode. And then, either due to your overcharging, or ch your charging in the bad weather, or you have manufacturing defect, you're going to create a shorting right there. Once it's short, it fast release electricity, and it creates a heating effect to 100 degrees Celsius, and, and later, about 180 degrees Celsius. At this moment, it's nearly, not pos it's nearly uh, impossible to stop the bad things happen. The battery is, is about to catch fire. You better run as fast as you can <laughs> in order to escape this. So it's the way we could stop those, make the battery completely safe. And this has been the topic we have been uh, you know, trying to brainstorm for a long time. So some of the ideas I want to show you right here. For example, how do I detect that lithium metal dendrite before it shorts my battery completely? So we are thinking about putting a detector in the middle of separator that can detect the dendrite halfway. What about the battery shorting really happen? You want to prevent the battery go above 100 degrees Celsius. Let's put a thermal switch inside Working with Professor Zhenan Bao in chemical engineering, we come up with a new idea how to do so. Or if it really needs to go busted, you know, it's going to be burned, let's put in some fire extinguisher inside. That's the fire retardant without impact of battery performance. How do you use a nanoscale encapsulation to encapsulate fire retardant inside the battery to make the battery safe? So idea like this, I see down the road, will help the whole industry to make the batteries better and better for the wider uh, application. 
So now let me also share with you and uh, um, Sally's talk. Sally highlight a work uh, done by a VO2 that's very important using X-ray to look inside what, how the battery really works. How do we produce a battery lasting for 30 years, 10,000 cycle or longer? I mean, that has been a challenging as well. Two years ago, we adopted this technique called cryogenic electron microscopy. This is Nobel Prize winning technique last year. Biologists developed this technique um, for looking at biomolecules. Two years ago, we utilized this technique to study our batteries, to freeze the batteries to very, very cold temperature. Nothing really moved, stabilized the whole batteries. We can look at it inside electron mic microscopy. This allowed us for the first time to understand uh, at the material's interface what's really there, that 20 nanometer thick layer. That determines how fast lithium can come in and go out and uh, stabilize the batteries. That to very large degree affecting how long your batteries can last, whether it's seven, three years, seven years, or 25 years in the future. So a technique like this, we have a stand for building up you know, very strong capability. These will enable us to understand this black box magic inside the batteries. So I also want to touch upon how far the batteries can go. What about the re uh, resource availability based on the lithium ion? This has been a, a heated topic for quite a while. So global reserve right now, that means easily mine lithium resources is about 40 million tons. What does it mean? We can make 10 billion Nissan Leaf out of that. We can make 3 billion Tesla out of that, roughly. So to consume that amount of lithium, we are still far away. So for a decade, you don't need to worry. However, for a much longer time scale, once we have a billion car on the street, all electrical, we have grid scale storage, we do need to consider that. Luckily, we have virtually infinite amount of lithium in the ocean, although the concentration is just too low. So recently, uh, Steve Chu and I, we started to do a joint project. How do we get lithium out of ocean? It looks promising. I will also encourage our young students to take on this challenge to work on this problem. Once this is solved, I think lithium, the whole industry, become nearly a done deal, but not quite. We still need to consider the availability of cobalt and nickel. You look at the price over the years, right? It, it go up multiple times and then it come down, right? The cobalt is $27 per kilogram. And nickel is cheaper. That's why you see the whole battery industry try to move into the high nickel and low cobalt. Cobalt just too expensive. We don't have enough cobalt to supply for the electrical car. Lithium is probably not a problem, but cobalt will be the problem. So it will be even better we can use sulfur. Sulfur is virtually free. It's the side product of petroleum engineering. You want to get that sulfur out of your gasoline, it smells really bad. There's a mountain of sulfur available. People are waiting for you to take them away. <laughs> so this, I think, eventually has a huge impact on the battery's cost. And also, I want to also emphasize this one unsolved problem, battery recycling. You look at all the valuable components inside. We have copper foil, we have cobalt, we have lithium, we have nickel. How do we really get all this valuable stuff out after the end of the battery life? And you look at the current process and recycling the batteries. By the way, everybody needs to look at every step clearly. No, I'm joking. So this is just for showing you. <laughs> this is just for showing you how complex that is. Don't really look at it, but this can make you dizzy. Uh, so the battery recycling technology is not quite there yet. We need new inventions to work on these problems. So you look at all these uh, challenges and opportunities. At Stanford, yesterday, uh, Arun mentioned our Storage X initiative. We are very serious about that. How do we join force of academia research with industries scale up, you know, a, a, a pilot scale testing? We want to work very close with industry to really push this forward. We have a lot of talented students right here, hunger for the new problem to work on, 
and uh, we we can talk about this uh, you know after uh, after my talk about the storage acts. So this other battery is also out there. Let me make a brief comment and then I will end. What about solid state? Important, solid state can help the battery become very safe without using organic electrolyte, possibly enable lithium metal by an early stage. So let's need to do long-term research to support this area. What about fast charging? We didn't mention that too much in this talk. It's very important as well. Indeed, recently, Department of, en Department of Energy, the uh, uh, Office of uh, vehicle, uh, te vehicle Technology, started a program of battery fast charging. Stanford team with one of, one of the proposals in order to do so. And what about swapping batteries? That idea is still valid in some countries. This requires a very strong government force to unify the standard of the batteries in order to do so. What about sodium, magnesium, aluminum batteries? That, these are the new chemistry, you know, magnesium, aluminum, sodium, they are a lot cheaper. These are viable ideas. However, to develop the whole thing from the electro materials, electrolyte, everything, we are still not quite there. You know, moving lithium, they're so, they're so small, lithium ions, sodium, Bigger, magnesium 2 plus, aluminum 3 plus oxidation state, they move really, really slow. We don't know how to do that yet. Require quite a bit of fundamental study as the backup technology for the future. We should support those. So eventually, like com coming to the grid scale, just one, of, one or two more slides is $100 per kilowatt hour. If you do seasonal storage, probably $10 per kilowatt hour or less, 20, 30 years, 10,000 cycles. We don't know how to do that yet. So half a year ago, we published one of the paper. It's really trying to marry fuel cell on the hydrogen side. That's very robust. And the battery, that's nickel and manganese chemistry, very low cost. We realize 10,000 cycles, and uh, particularly for nickel system, we know it's going to run for 30 years. This type of idea might enable us to have a new solution for the grid scale storage. Let me summarize. It seems very clear to me for the mobile application, transportation, is the world of lithium ion. But we still need to have a few problems to solve. For grid scale, the opportunity is wide open. There's a number of batteries chemistry promising, and also fuel cell is a strong contender in that area as well. I will end my talk right here. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will be happy to discuss if you have questions later. Thank you very much.